As the largest economy in the world, the European Union is a unique supranational political entity and its 28 member states are deeply integrated. Closely tied with each other, the European countries share a common view on peaceful development. The success of the EU is largely based upon the post-war reconciliation and cooperation between two old enemies, Germany and France. European countries had long been great powers in the world before the two world wars of the 20th century, but they were also destroyed by bullets and bombs. Witnessing the devastation in Berlin after the war, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill remarked that it was not what he had wanted. It would take 20 years to rebuild the ruined city. As the antagonist in two world wars, Germany was at a critical moment in its history. It was occupied by four victorious nations and encircled by its old enemies, especially its neighbor to the west, France. In the 70 years prior to the end of World War II, three catastrophic conflicts had broken out between the two countries. With great fear and a deep hatred of its foe, France insisted that Germany must be dismembered, depriving it of its ability to wage another war. Germany and France had been the focal point of Europe since ancient times, and the future of the continent depended on their choices at this time. Faced with challenges both domestically and internationally, West Germany elected its first post-war chancellor in 1949. 73-year-old Konrad Adenauer had been thinking about the future of Europe since the First World War, and he had concluded that frequent conflicts and wars in Europe arose from upsets to the balance of power. In his view, only unification could redeem Europe from ultimate failure, and this unity must be based on reconciliation between Germany and France, which were old historical enemies. With the Cold War spreading across Europe, the United States needed the support of Germany to confront the Soviet Union. Therefore, France had to abandon its hardline stance against Germany and began to find other ways to contain its old foe. Germany had a great capacity to produce vital war materials. To contain Germany's potential capability to wage war, France began to look for a way to curb its coal and steel production. In May 1950, French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman proposed a plan that put France and Germany's production of coal and steel under a single umbrella organization. This was intended to achieve mutual constraints by managing vital war resources jointly. 当时就是法国人提出来要搞美港联姻的时候 in 1952, the European Coal and Steel Community was established by six member states, including West Germany, France and Italy. It was the first step towards European integration. However, there were tougher tasks to accomplish concerning reconciliation between Germany and France. With the acquiescence of the United States, the second largest industrial area of Germany, the Saarland, was occupied by France after World War II. Adenauer was therefore faced with a dilemma. He could not give up Germany's sovereignty over the Saarland, but he was determined to reconcile with France. In spite of domestic nationalist uproar, Adenauer agreed to France retaining economic control over the Saarland in return for the possibility of the political autonomy of the local people. The Saarland rejoined West Germany after a referendum in 1957, while Germany offered tremendous financial support to France and gave a third of the total mineral production of the Saarland to France as compensation. Adenauer 
Adenauer believed that the future of Germany rested with its reconciliation with France. The trust of other countries could only be gained cautiously and gradually, and Germany should try its best not to do anything that would arouse suspicions from any interested party. The president of France at that time was Charles de Gaulle. He later recalled that from the autumn of 1958 to 1962, he and Adenauer corresponded more than 40 times and attended 15 meetings amounting to more than 100 hours. All this effort culminated in the signing of the Elysee Treaty. By the time the Elysee Treaty was signed, Adenauer was 87 years old and had been pursuing the political goal of aiding Germany's reconciliation for 14 years. After his death in 1967, the media commented that Adenauer had led a defeated Germany on the brink of failure to recovery through an amazing feat of perseverance. The Adenauer era ended, but Germany's steps towards reconciliation continued. After being elected as the Chancellor of West Germany in 1969, the leader of the Social Democratic Party, Willy Brandt, began to implement Ostpolitik in an effort to reconcile with the Soviet Union and a number of Eastern European countries. Prior to this, West Germany had supported the diplomatic policy adopted by the Western world. In December 1970, Brandt visited Poland as part of his attempt to solve the border issues between West Germany and Poland. At the 1945 Potsdam Conference, where the Allied leaders had discussed how to punish a defeated Germany and establish post-war order in Europe, German territory on the eastern side of the Oder and lusatia nysa rivers came under the control of Poland. By signing the Treaty of Warsaw with Poland, West Germany recognized the oder nysa line as the western border of Poland and ensured the inviability of the two countries' existing frontiers in the future. It was very cold on the day the treaty was signed. Brandt fell spontaneously to his knees as he laid a wreath to the memorial for the Jews murdered in the Warsaw Ghetto, shocking all those who witnessed this act of contrition. The Western media exclaimed that when Brandt knelt down, Germany stood up once again. Led by Brandt, West Germany established diplomatic relations with Czechoslovakia and Hungary and reconciled with the Soviet Union and other Eastern European countries. After the reunification of Germany in 1990, the oder nysa line was reaffirmed. The territory of Germany was thus reduced from the pre-war area of around 500 square kilometers to 357,000 square kilometers. However, land was not all it sacrificed. <laughs> Tangro 不能跟法国对着干。The European Union was established in 1993 with France and German leadership at its core. With its strong economy, Germany has been the largest contributor to the EU budget ever since. It offered tremendous financial support in pulling member states through the European debt crisis. 
，我就是这个德国人的正确的吸取的历史的教训。如果说希特勒想通过枪炮、通过战争来扩大他的生存空间，那么德国人现在战后呢，通过他的优质的产品，通过他的经济的实力来扩大的市场，来赢得人心。In my opinion, this epoch is Something new in world history. The mentality of the Europeans is clear. There will be no war any longer on the ground of Europe. The Europeans have to march on. They can't do any. They can't go back and say, "Come back to the good old Germany." One of the most important outcomes of the experience of the Europeans, and not only the Germans, the Germans very, very uh, emphatically. Of the Second World War. As neighboring countries, Japan and China share deep cultural roots. Japanese culture has been profoundly influenced by Chinese civilization. However, from the First Sino-Japanese War to the two world wars of the 20th century, wars of aggression waged by Japan have left other Asian countries with painful memories. The first generation of collective Chinese leadership spared no efforts in promoting the post-war normalization of Sino-Japanese relations. And in the 1970s and 1980s, cultural and economic exchanges nurtured friendship between the people of the two countries. However, except for a few cautious and limited official apologies, the Japanese government repeatedly expressed ambiguous views on a range of historical issues, antagonizing its neighboring countries, including China and South Korea. In 2014, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe changed the government's interpretation of the constitution, drawing strong suspicion from a number of Asian countries as to its future direction. In June 2014, thousands of Japanese people demonstrated in front of the Prime Minister's official residence. In order to pave the way for Japan's self-defense forces to use force overseas, Abe proposed a reinterpretation of the constitution. This was partly intended to tackle the intensified dispute with China over the Daoyu Island issue. Using the current Japanese Communist Party President Shinzo Abe's words, he said that the Japanese have a peaceful solution. The young people don't care about the army. The young people don't care about the army. So in this situation, we should change the situation of the Japanese government. 要发展军事，要改变他的军事的体制，那么怎么办？就只好去宣传中国威胁论。After World War II, the Daoyu Islands should have been returned to China as islands affiliated to Taiwan. This was in accordance with the Cairo Declaration and the Potsdam Declaration. But the U.S. then transferred administrative control of the islands to Japan. From the 1990s onwards, Japan tried to provoke quarrels and even said it had organized the purchase of the islands in 2012. In responding to these moves, the government of China has expressed a solemn position and stressed that Daoyu Island and its affiliated islands are part of China's inherent territory, and any transfer of the islands between Japan and the U.S. is completely illegal. Under the pressure of China's solemn position, the U.S. declared publicly that it takes no position on the ownership of the Daoyu Islands, but Japan continues to carry out provocations at sea. History 一点一滴的，日本话叫“那西库子西”，就是一点一点的叫你不知不觉间啊，呃，到那天你醒悟起来的时候，他已经都做了。所以对日本来讲，无论是站在他自己的角度，还是站在人类文明的角度，他都应该去反思这个：我们为什么会发动针对邻国的东亚邻国的侵略战争？这其实不仅仅说是邻国的要求了，他本国的以后的未来的世代。
也需要他们现这一个时代去把这个问题理清楚。これは国家と国家の問題じゃないです。一つの被害者とそれから国の問題です。だったら。In Tokyo's Rijong College, Yamabe Yukiko is giving a lecture on wartime atrocities perpetrated by the Japanese army. Publicity campaigns like this have become this 85-year-old woman's most important work. Yukiko came to live in northeast China with her parents when she was a teenager. Before her return to Japan in the 1950s, she joined the Eighth Route Army and served as a medical assistant. Yukiko traveled frequently between Japan and China after she retired, getting to know more about the war crimes committed by Japan's Unit 731. Later, she joined a team of scholars and collected verbal evidence from war crime participants in Japan. But in the hometown of Shiro Ishii, the commander of Unit 731, Yukiko didn't find what she was looking for. イーがツンズチェンスチュー自産用で、ピンコンで農民、単調イーがディーズラ、ヨーチェンラ、ノワイーライ、トイ、主人スラン、メイショマイーチェン。アルチェトウェス、好像是、谢谢、主人啦。As the director of Unit 731, Shiro Ishii attempted to escape trial by faking his own death. Other Unit 731 leaders were eventually appointed to key posts in the Japanese Public Health Agency, Medical University and Government Biotechnology Company. The Japanese media remained silent on the issue. このことは日本人が昔の戦争の時に犯した悪い。In 1993, Yukiko and her colleagues began to hold exhibitions about Unit 731 war crimes across Japan. They raised 40 million yen for the construction of a Unit 731 museum in Harbin. お金持ちは一切お金出さないです。お金出すのは小学生。おばちゃんこれ何っていうからこうですよって説明するとえー、大変だって言って自分のお小遣いねとお小遣いは1円とか10円とか多くても100円です。In June 2014, Yukiko was living in a Tokyo suburb. In order to raise money for the exhibition, she had sold her big house in the downtown area several years before and moved into a crowded hostel for the elderly. Apart from some everyday items, her little room is piled high with books about the war and well-preserved photo albums. In June 2014, the choir affiliated to Fu Shun's Miracles Inheritance Association was rehearsing for a performance called Regeneration of the Earth at Hokkaido University. Mitsuyoshi Himeta is a retired Cho University professor. He founded the choir and is still in charge of it. The Chinese government decided to rehabilitate more than a thousand Japanese prisoners of war left in mainland China in 1949. After their release in 1964, they returned to Japan. 
In return for the tolerance and rehabilitation efforts provided by the Chinese people, they founded the Fushan's Miracles Inheritance Association with the purpose of revealing the truth through actual evidence. The song tells the story of a Chinese nurse who works in a war criminal's management center. Although the Japanese army killed her child, she eventually overcomes her hatred and moves the prisoners with her tolerance. These people have a strong conscience and deeply held moral principles and are determined to make their voice heard in spite of their weakness or strength. On March the 9th, 2015, German Chancellor Angela Merkel pointed out in a speech in Tokyo that facing up to history is the precondition of reconciliation. She told Japan that what made it possible for Germany to succeed in finding its way back into the international community is a complete break with the past. The following day, March the 10th, was the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Tokyo. Abe defied the political conventions of Japan and attended the memorial event in his role as Prime Minister. When the Second World War was mentioned, he didn't use words like invasion in his speech. Public opinion concluded that Abe intended to claim that Japan was itself a victim of World War II by reminding the world of its sufferings in the war. The website of U.S. magazine The National Interest carried an article entitled U.S. should be appalled by Japan's historical revisionism. It said that if Imperial Japan was itself a victim in World War II, then Harry Truman, not Hideki Tojo, must be the war criminal. In September 2013, a photograph of the leaders of Germany and France hugging World War II survivors touched the whole world. As German Chancellor Angela Merkel remarked, only the recognition of history can build a bright future. Both Germany and Japan waged wars of aggression against neighboring countries during the Second World War. Seventy years later, Germany has been forgiven by its enemies due to its heartfelt remorse. It offers a new approach to peaceful development by persistently promoting the idea of European integration. In contrast, Japan has failed to reflect on the savagery imposed upon its people and the people of other countries by war, and even attempts to cover up the true facts of history while provoking border disputes. The curtain of World War II fell long ago, but the horrifying massacres and death of 60 million people in the war should always remind us that once war breaks out, nobody can stay out of it or predict the outcome. If a nation cannot profoundly rethink its recent history, then it is unable to reassure the world of its accountability in the future. It should be the hope of every rational person that in the years, decades and centuries ahead, every country in the world can strive to avoid war and embrace peace. <laughs>